test-driven development is the single most powerful tool you have for preventing bugs within your application. That's not just my opinion, but it's a scientifically proven fact. In exchange for effort and productivity, you get better quality software that is more maintainable long-term. Lucky for you, Angular comes built in with Jasmine and Karma, so testing is really easy to get started with. In this video, I'll give you a tour of Angular's testing tools and show you how to deal with third-party dependencies like Firebase. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe, and you can always get the full source code on angularfirebase.com. The first thing I'm going to do is generate a brand new Angular 5 app, and then I'll show you what all the different testing files do. The Angular CLI generates all of the boilerplate code automatically, so we'll start by looking at the Karma config file. Karma works by setting up a web server that will run all of your tests automatically every time a file changes. You have some configuration options here if you want to customize that experience. You also have a protractor config file, which is specifically for end-to-end -end tests. End-to-end -end testing uses the browser to simulate how the end user sees your app, so it's completely decoupled from your main app code. That's why we have this E2E directory in the root of the project, and I'll show you how to use it in a future video. Now, moving into the source directory, we have a test.ts file. It's required by Karma to load all your spec files. You shouldn't really have to change anything in here. Now let's take a look at our first real test, which is the app component spec ts file. This just looks like a big jumble of code, so let's break the test down into its fundamental parts. The first part of any test is to describe the test suite. In Jasmine, you do this by using the describe keyword, followed by whatever you're testing. The purple text represents Jasmine, the green represents what we're going to write. We write all the tests inside this describe block, each one starting with it. So we're going to say it should be awesome. Then you'll write an expectation that verifies whether this is true or false. So with Jasmine, we could do something like expect component to be awesome. The end result is that you've described the behavior of your code in a way that can be easily read by a non-programmer. Describing and validating your code in this way is the reason that testing is so effective at reducing bugs. Now we need something to test, so I'm going to start by generating this alert button component. It's just a simple button that will toggle the visibility of this alert message whenever it's clicked. We'll start by testing its static values, but eventually we'll use Angular Fire 2 to populate its warning message. If we look at the component TypeScript, I just have a couple of properties hard-coded in here, and then I have a toggle method that will toggle the value of the hide content property. Then the template HTML just shows these properties and adds a button that will toggle the visibility of that message. The message is hidden by default, and that's something we're going to test here in the upcoming steps. So now let's set up our alert button spec from scratch. The first thing we're going to do is import Angular's testing utilities, and then we're going to describe our test suite, which is the Angular button component. At this point, we're going to declare a variable for the fixture, and a fixture is just the test environment for this component. So it provides access to the component itself, as well as its debug element, which is its rendered HTML. Now, before each spec, we need to set up a test bed, which is just an ng module specific for this testing environment. The most simple example is just an isolated test of the component itself, and that's where we're going to start, but this will get increasingly more complex. If you want to compile the component's HTML and CSS, then you'll call this compile components method after the testbed. After the testbed's been compiled, we can then set up a few variables here that we'll actually use for testing. We can test the component directly, or we can test its rendered HTML via the debug element. And lastly, we'll run Angular change detection before each of these tests, but you could test things before change detection as well. Now we're ready to write the first spec. The first thing we'll test is whether or not the component is created successfully. So we can say it should create, and then we'll expect component to be truthy. Just a quick side note, truthy means that something evaluates to true in a Boolean context. It doesn't mean what you're testing is actually the primitive true value. This is one of the many Jasmine matchers, and I recommend going to the docs to get acquainted with all of them. Now that we have our spec, we can just run ng-test, and that'll bring up a browser window saying whether or not it passed or failed. Now I'm just going to leave Karma running so we can see how it updates every time we write a new spec. The second spec is going to see whether or not the content message has a substring of warn. In this case, the content was just hard-coded as a property on the component, so we can say component content to contain the string of warn. The to contain matcher will check for a substring, or if it was an array, it would check for an element in that array. Now if we save this file, you can see the karma runner on the left will update with the spec, and it will be passing as well. So the actual message content is you will be warned. So let's see what happens if we use a jasmine matcher that looks for an exact match. 
This time we'll get a failing test, and it's also going to tell us exactly why it failed. It expected the string of you have been warned to be warned, which would be false. You can also rate specs based on logical numeric values. So let's say we have a severity level on the alert, and we want to see if it is greater than 2. In this case, it's actually 423. So if we say expect component severity to be greater than 2, that should be a passing test. So far, we've only tested properties on the component itself, but now let's see if it actually rendered properly in the DOM. So we'll say it should have an H1 tag of alert button. To do that, we use the debug element, and it has a DSL that allows us to query elements in the DOM. So we would say query by the CSS of H1. Then we can get the native HTML element. At that point, we just have the string that's inside the h1 tag, and then we can validate that it is the alert button text. So now let's move on to a spec that will tell us whether or not a function is doing what it's supposed to do. We wrote a toggle method earlier that toggles a boolean variable, so we'll say it should toggle the message boolean, and first we'll expect the component hide content to be truthy, because it's hidden by default. Then we can execute that toggle button method, then we'll run another expectation that this time the component hide content boolean is falsy. That one passes as well, so we know that our method is performing what it's supposed to perform. But what if that change happens asynchronously, as many things do in Angular? Back in the component, I'm going to define a method called toggle async, which will run the toggle method after an RxJS timer of 500 milliseconds runs out. The spec is going to be it should toggle the message boolean asynchronously. Then we're going to wrap this in the fake async helper from Angular. This creates a fake Angular zone that we can use to test asynchronous activity. The test is exactly the same as the last one, but calls the toggle async method. As you can see here, it fails because Angular doesn't wait for the 500 milliseconds to run out before testing that property. We also have a tick utility that we can use here in the fake async block. And so if we set that to 499 milliseconds, you can see here that we still get a failing test. The timer we set is 500 milliseconds, so if we add just one more millisecond to it, then the test will pass. That gives you a few basic examples of Angular component testing, but now let's add a service to the mix using Angular Fire 2. What we're going to do is create a service that returns an observable from the Firebase real-time database, and that's going to replace the content that we had hard-coded in the component before. If you're not familiar with Angular Fire 2, make sure to follow the setup instructions on the main documentation. You also need to have a Firebase account, and inside the real-time database I have an alerts node with a test alert that says you have been warned. Then I'm going to generate a service with the CLI, and you can test your service directly, but for this video we're just going to focus on the component. The service itself is very simple, we just add Angular Fire database to the constructor, and then we'll set up one method in here called getContent, which will retrieve that message from the database as an observable. When running your tests, you don't want to actually use live data from the real backend. You should only simulate how that backend data would be returned by using what's called a stub. A stub is simply a method that returns some data in a way that's predictable and reproducible. So what I'm doing here is setting up a variable called service stub. It's going to be an object that has a function in it that returns the observable in the same form that we'd expect back from Firebase. So the get content property is a function that returns an observable of the message you have been warned. This gives us mock data that we can use to interact with the service without actually having to make a real request to Firebase. Then we can use this stub as a service by adding it to our testbed in the providers array. But instead of providing a live service, we do an object that has provide with the message service and then use value with our service stub. This tells the test environment to use the stub instead of the actual live data. At this point, all we have to do is write our spec, and it should return this observable like we would expect. This time we'll say it should have message content defined from an observable, and then what we'll do is subscribe to that observable and put our expectations inside the subscribe block. We expect the content to be defined and to be you have been warned. This is the easiest way to test mock data from a service, but it is limited in certain respects. For example, we can't tell how many times this method has been called, which might be important if you have a method that is not idempotent. To address this, I'm going to stub our service using a different method called a spy. This time we're going to actually use the live service, so we're going to need to set up our testbed with AngularFire2. Then I'll set another variable for our service and another one for the spy.
From there, I'm going to add Angular Fire 2 to the import section of the testbed. And then in the provider section, I'll take out the stub and add the live service to it. Then we can get rid of our previous service stub, and then we'll set up the spy here, which comes from Jasmine. We can call spy on and then pass it the main service class as well as the method that we want to monitor. So in this case, it's going to be our get content method. We still don't want to use any live data from Firebase. So what we do is tell our spy to return a value of an observable of the message. What this is going to do is allow us to see whenever this method has been called and with what arguments it was called with. And it's never going to actually make a live request. So it just stubs the return value. And to get the service class, we call debug element injector get with the message service. So our spy is ready to go. Now we can just jump down and write our next spec. This time I want to make sure that the method is only called once. And I want to make sure that the view is updated with the corresponding observable data. So we can make sure our service method was called by calling expect spy to have been called. Then we can see how many times it was called by calling spies calls all, which is an array. And then we can test the length of that array, and it should be 1. So we'll say 2 equal 1. Then we're also unwrapping an observable in the HTML. So I want to make sure that this method results in an observable that gets rendered in the HTML itself. So we'll use query on the debug element to get the message body. Then we can look at the native element inner text, and that should be the message you have been warned. So we can just call to contain warn to verify that. Then we can go ahead and save it, and it's going to run our spec, and it passes as expected. The spy can do a whole bunch of other stuff too, like see where the method was called and with which arguments, so check out the Jasmine docs for more information on that. That's it for Angular Component Testing Basics. If this video helped you, please like and subscribe. And if you want to learn more advanced concepts, consider becoming a pro subscriber at angularfirebase.com. You'll get a whole bunch of exclusive content, one-on-one -on -one project support via Slack, and a free copy of my book. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.